Hello YouTube, Stock Investor Guy here. How's everybody doing? So on this video, what I am going to do is I am going to do a book review on a book that I just finished yesterday. And the book is The Great Crash, 1929 by John Kenneth Galbraith. Okay. And the book that I read is the third edition, 1972, of the book. Uh, the book was originally published 19... One moment here. 1954. 1954 was when the book was originally published. And I'm not sure if there's other editions after the edition that I read. I would think that there is because the third edition is 1972. So I'm thinking that there might be a fourth and a fifth edition. But the one, I'm re the one I read was third edition. Okay, John Kenneth Galbraith was an economist from the 20th century. Uh, he was basically all, an e economic historian as well. And he's written several books. Uh, he uh, he wrote a lot of books in the 20th century. And uh, I have several of his other books. I have The Age of Uncertainty. I have The uh, the Affluent Society. And I have A Life in Our Times, which is uh, like an autobiography that he wrote. Um, so, th But this, this book review is on The Great Crash, 1929. And I did write some notes. So I'll go ahead and I'll start. Um, Basically, uh, the book starts explaining, uh, you know, what happened well, the pri previous years uh, before the crash of 1929. Uh, the crash itself was October, in October of 1929. And the most, the worst day for the stock market, according to the book, was on October 29th, 1929. That was the day that the, the stock market really crashed. Okay. However, keep in mind, though, that that was just one day. The market had been very volatile, uh, which means it had gone up and down, up and down drastically ever since like September. And, and there was a few months prior to that where it was also kind of volatile, but the strong volatility began in September and October. But the crash, I guess if you want to pinpoint it down to an exact date, would be October 29th, 1929. And that was a Tuesday. According to the book, that was the worst day for the stock market. Okay. So, uh, I, I'm not going to cover the first part of the, the first chapters because I if, if you go to my video history, uh, the title of the video that I want you to look at um, for the beginning part of the, I guess, the mainly book review that I did, uh, it, it, the title of the video is The Great Crash 2018, where at the end of the video, it's a, like a 20 minute video, I believe, and at the end of the video, I go into the, the first few chapters of when I started reading the book. And I talk about the Florida land boom of the mid-1920s. Um, and so I'm not going to cover that again in this video because I don't want it to go, I don't want this video to go too long. So I'll start, I'll pick up, you know, where I left off. Uh, and, and if you want to see that, those, the mini book review on those first few chapters, check out the pre, my video, The Great Crash of 2018. Okay. So basically, uh, what John Kenneth Galbraith says about the cause of the crash was that there was a lot of uh, a, a huge feeling of I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to quote from here uh, such a feeling of trust is essential for a boom when uh, people are questioning suspicious they are immune to speculative and enthusiasm so uh, the the market uh, the, the investors okay, investors in the prior to the crash throughout 1928, 1929, were enthusiastic, were happy, it was happy times. Uh, you know, stocks were going up, people were borrowing a lot of money, people were uh, borrowing money from banks, from their brokerage houses in order to buy, uh, to speculate in stocks. And there was trust. Um, a lot of these investment trusts that were formed, uh, their assets in the 20s, their assets doubled, tripled, quadrupled. Uh, in in that period right before the crash, I think from 1927 to 1928, they had a huge infusion of capital uh, in these investment trusts. And according to John Kenneth Galbraith, that was part of the problem that um, 
there was a lot of, of trust in these companies who themselves were also borrowing from the Federal Reserve. So there was basically there was a lot of borrowing, a lot of leverage going on uh, prior to to the to the um, to the crash. Uh, there was a sharp criticism criticism also of the profits of doom. So there was a banker by the name of Warburg. Let me see if I can get his full name here. Okay, Warburg, uh, let me just get his full name. I don't want to not give you guys his full name here. Uh, oops, where's my... Oh, here they are. Sorry. Okay, Paul Warburg. Paul Warburg called for stronger Federal Reserve policy and argued that the present orgy of unrestrained speculation were not, if it weren't not brought too promptly to a halt, there would be ultimately a disastrous collapse. So he was one of the prudent ones that thought that, you know, this thing couldn't last for long and that this was a lot of just speculation and people just, uh, you know, following... Uh, rising stock market and and just believing that things couldn't ever ha go bad or and also there was really no reason to believe that things would something bad would happen I mean the economy overall was in, in fairly good shape according to John Kenneth Galbraith so people when when people were investing in stocks they had no reason to feel that you know there would be a crash um, but again that's also part of the you know nobody knows when a crash is gonna happen so you know a lot of people are optimistic and uh, you know, and sometimes that optimism is the cause of their their failure in the end. So let's see. Paul Warburg uh, I had it right here. Paul Warburg called for stronger Fed policy. Um, so he was one of the ones that again that the, that said, "Hey, you got to be careful. Things could end up bad here." But again, people like Charles Mitchell. A lot of these investment trusts, a lot of the bankers in New York City were, you know, saying, oh, don't listen to that guy. You know, he's wrong. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Even Andrew Mellon, who was the Treasury Secretary of the time, said there's no need, there's no cause for worry. Um, President Calvin Coolidge said that things were okay. And even Herbert Hoover was saying that, you know, I think Herbert Hoover said that, you know, things, everything's fine. So the politicians, the businessmen in New York City, the bankers, Everybody was saying things were fine, there's no need to worry, and people just kept investing. And again, when you're using borrowed money, it's dangerous. And when you're following uh, the, the advice of investment trust and the, and, and the people that worked at these banks blindly, then that's dangerous too. You should always do your own research. So continuing, continuing with the uh, book review, uh, the investment trust uh, had heavy borrowing, and they were a major factor in the crash, according to John Kenneth Galbraith. Valuations were out of control. Uh, as 1929 went along, it was plain that more and more of the new investors in the market were relying on the intellect and the science of the trust, which I've already mentioned. Uh, the inv these investment trusts had heavy leverage. Uh, one of the investment trusts in particular was Goldman Sachs Trading Corporation, and this was headed by Wachel Cattings. Uh, he was a, a banker at Goldman Sachs, and he was as a result of this um, crash, it almost uh, bankrupt Goldman Sachs. So think about it, guys. Uh, now Goldman Sachs is part of the Dow 30, I believe, and it's considered one of the safest companies. But back then, uh, it was uh, it was pretty uh, risky to to be investing with uh, you know Goldman Sachs Trading Corporation. This was an investment trust that they created in the 20s in order to participate in this market. Um, there was a, another investment trust, which was Blue Ridge, and, and there was also Shenandoah Investment Trust. And again, all these trusts were using heavy leverage, and according to John Kenneth Galbraith, this was a major reason for the crash. Uh, sh uh, let's see. 
1929, values of stocks are rising. Speculation is on the rise. Uh, large increases in loans. The New York banks, uh, National City Bank and the Chase uh, Chase Bank, uh, and then J.P. Morgan. Though they were separate back, you know, back in the day, they were still it was J.P. Morgan and Company, and then Chase. I be believe Chase was Chase National Bank. Uh, these were separate banks, and then there was National City Bank. These were some of the big banks in New York City at the time. Kind of like now, it's Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, you know Wells Fargo, but the banks back then were, were these that I just mentioned and they were borrowing heavily from the Federal Reserve to continue their speculation uh, The first day on September 5th 1929 the market begins to drop. Okay, so as I mentioned September and October were the scary months Okay, that's when people were getting really fearful and they were like, okay, what's going on here? Um, so volatility in the market for both September and October of 1929 the sell-off, uh, which basically means that people started dropping, getting out of their positions, began October 1929. Uh, the worst day of the market was Tuesday, October 29th, 1929, uh, considered Black Tuesday. And right after the crash, there were suicides. Uh, people began jumping from buildings, and uh, a lot of, I guess, a lot of them lost everything, um, and they they just didn't see a future. Uh, being broke and and they just lost it all and, and and a lot of bankers committed suicide there's even a part in the book where he mentions that um, John Kenneth Galbraith mentions that you know when you would check in at a hotel uh, you know the the receptionist there the the hotel clerk would ask you you know are you you know don't jump out don't jump out the window uh, you know do you want it to to stay do you want to you know stay in the hotel for purposes of staying in the hotel and you're not going to do anything crazy or you're going to jump out the window. He mentioned something along those lines in, in the book. Uh, meeting of the bankers. Uh, when the crash happened, uh, these bankers that I talked about in New York City, the major bankers, um, they, they met uh, to see what, you know, they could do to try to help and they try to spread optimism and, you know, don't worry. Uh, they they try to spread the word for in the media you know don't, don't you know don't worry everything's fine so that the public could not worry and or they called it organized support okay that they were trying to spread through the markets however it didn't work um, it calmed the markets for a little while but it did not work overall um, the country was ultimately was was led into a depression um, and I'm going to get to that towards the end of the video, the Great Depression. Again, the Great Depression, guys, is, is a 10-year period. Uh, it, that happened after the crash, but it wasn't necessarily as a result of the crash. And I will discuss that more in detail it, it further. So uh, keep keep stay tuned. Uh, let's see. Senator Carter Glass blamed Charles Mitchell, the guy from National City Bank, for the trouble. Uh, again, these bankers, you know, they were borrowing heavily. They were... Uh, not responsible uh, they were they were doing all kinds of shady stuff to themselves think about it guys this was before the SEC the Securities and Exchange Commission there was really no regulation on Wall Street there was a heavy insider trading there was manipulation of stocks going on uh, so a lot of these bankers were able to get away with a lot of things um, and Senator Carter Glass who the Glass-Steagall Act is named after um, he, uh, it, the Glass-Steagall Act basically was the act that was responsible for breaking up the commercial banks from investment banks. Um, that law, that law was repealed in 1999, I believe, by the Glam, Graham Leach Bliley Act, uh, in 1999, 2000, uh, around that time. And it basically did away with that law so that banks could, commercial banks and investment banks could now be together again. And so that's why you have, you know, um, you know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, a lot of these banks that are commercial banks now have uh, investment uh, bank branches, you know, within that bank. But Carter Glass and the Glass-Steagall Act did away with that, but they repealed it uh, in late in 1999-2000. Okay, so, but Carter Glass at the time blamed Charles Mitchell for the trouble. Uh, the as And then as a result of the crash, uh, the Securities Act of 1933 and 1934 were passed where the a lot of regulation was going to come to Wall Street. And the banks, uh, the SEC, Security and Exchange Commission, was created. The FDIC was created. And there was also requirements uh, on the margin margin requirements where people were not were not allowed to borrow too much, um, you know, from, from their banks to, to buy stocks. 
Um, and then what's interesting, one thing that John, John Kenneth Galbraith mentions in the book is that what's interesting is that after the crash, a lot of these investment trusts and, and the bankers that were uh, heading them were looking at the banks, uh, at the stocks, at you know, the depressed prices as a bargain and as a buying opportunity. And they kind of, you know, their, their, their belief in the stocks that, that they owned, because the investment trust issued the stocks, and they were, they were buying back their own shares, and, they were, and, and John Kenneth Galbraith says they were swindling themselves. They were kind of like tricking themselves because they were buying worthless pieces of securities, and yet they, they did, in their mind, they were getting the bargain. They didn't see that, hey, what a disaster this had been. Let's, let's you know, close this investment trust and get away from all this. No, they borrowed even more money to buy back their shares and, and to get those shares because they thought they were getting a bargain. So they got like double trouble here, you know, because not only did they already crash, but down there that the prices are, are low, they're, you know, buying more of the, that, you know, of the crap they were selling, you know, you can't find a better word for that, but it was basically, that's what it was. Um, Ivar Kruger, which is the match king, he was a, uh, basically a fraudster and around that time you know in the late 20s and uh he committed he committed suicide in paris he also uh, i think lost a lot of money but he he robbed a lot of people there's a great book about him uh it's called the match king and it's written by frank partner one of my favorite authors i really recommend that book and it tells his whole story just just what he you know what he did and, and the crimes he committed and uh but it does mention in the book that he was uh one of the people that committed suicide um, after the crash and let's see okay and then so yeah, okay let me just see this really quick okay so I'll put this away guys and then so this is basically like the, what I've discussed right now up to this point is basically like the middle part of the book. Um, towards the, you know, the last few chapters, uh, it's called the Aftermath 1, Aftermath 2, and then the, the consequences of the crash. Uh, John, John Kenneth Galbraith uh, goes into detail about the Great Depression that followed after. And one thing that's interesting that I didn't know is that he mentions that, um, sorry, oops, let's see. Um, he mentions that the the Great Depression was not really a result of the uh, Great Crash. Um, what happened is that the economy, uh, it, it, while it was strong, there was... He says that you can't with certainty pinpoint why the Great Depression happened. You can, you, you, we knew, you know, according to the book, we know why the Great Crash happened. The volatility, the trading on margin, you know, the, the banks doing their shady things, these bankers, uh, the, the blindly following the herd, uh, and people, you know, Main Street investing in the market and, you know, having a lot of faith and optimism in these bankers and the bankers willing willingness to lend and and borrow from the fed so that those were the results of the crash <clears throat> however the results the the reasons for the crash were those but the res, the reasons for the great depression that followed it he says in the in the book that it's not really a result of the great crash um he says it's hard to pinpoint a reason for the great depression that followed the great crash and here i do want to quote from the book because he, he raises some really good points um let's see Okay, so let me see here. Okay, so I'm going to quote, uh, this is from page 176. Finally, a speculative outbreak has a greater or less immunizing effect. The ensuing collapse automatically destroys the very mood speculation requires. It follows that an outbreak of speculation provides a reasonable assurance that another outbreak will not immediately occur. With time and the dimming of memory, the immunity wears off. A recurrence becomes possible. Okay, well, this is actually not the quote that I wanted, but it says, uh, the, the causes of the Great Depression are still far from certain. 
A lack of certainty, it may also be observed, is not evident in the contemporary writing on the subject. When people are least sure, they are often most dogmatic. Okay. Um, Okay, so basically, um, he doesn't know why the Great Depression happened. He, he, in the last chapter, it's called Cause and Consequences. He says that there could be... He says that the economy had weakened in the early summer well before the crash. So, while they had a, while the economy was good, you know, throughout the 20s, it was an okay uh, economy. He says in the early summer months before the crash, it's starting to weaken. Um, there are there are possible causes for the depression, um, and then he he goes into them. Okay, so there's five that he talks about. Number one, a bad distribution of income. So there was a high income inequality. Um, you know, similar to today, you know, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting worse, uh, and and um, you know, he says that this inequality, uh, for some reason, you know, the disproportion of income, you know, uh, he says that the economy was dependent on a high level of investment or a high level of luxury consumer spending or both. The rich cannot buy great quantity quantities of bread. Uh, so, in other words, I guess he's trying to say, you know, with the the bad distribution of income, the rich kind of like really, you know, got out of the market. A lot of them lost everything, committed suicide, but they got out of the market and they just were not spending, you know, and that hurt the economy. And that he says this may be a, one of the reasons why the Great Depression happened, but again, he can't pinpoint it. Okay, number two. The bad corporate structure, uh, you know, the, the investment, the investment trust and the holding companies, bad news, you know, that, that, that was also maybe another one of the reasons why we, we went into a Great Depression in the 30s, according to John Kenneth Galbraith. Number three, the bad banking structure. Uh, you know, again, the banks didn't have any regulation, very little regulations. These bankers pretty much did anything they wanted to do. They could manipulate stocks. They could. There was insider trading going on. Um, let's see, the dubious state of foreign of the foreign balance. Uh, this is goes into like high tariffs, which restricted imports and helped to create a surplus of exports. Uh, During the First World War, the United States became a creditor on the international account. In the decade following the surplus of exports over imports, which once had paid the interest and principal on loans from Europe, continued. Uh, let's see. Most loans were to governments, national, state, or municipal bodies. Uh, there was just shady loans. There was a loan to President of Cuba, Machado. Uh, so that's basically what he's covering there. Not, not really. You know, he, he just again, he's, he's not. He doesn't know a reason why, a pin, uh, an exact reason why that for the Great Depression. He's just kind of throwing that out there too. Number five, and the last reason, is the poor state of the econ economic intelligence. Um, so. To regard the people of any time particular, as particularly obtuse uh, seems vaguely improper, and it, it also establishes a precedent which members of this generation might regret. So people were kind of like just, you know, Warren Buffett said in one of his interviews that people grow wiser and humanity has achieved so much in our history of, of being in, on this earth and humans, you know, have achieved so much. However, they, they never grow smarter in emotion and in the way they think about things uh, like, the, like the stock market. Um, if you have a rising stock market or any other asset class for that matter, um, you know, the people, some, some people, not everybody, but some people, they, they completely lose sight of the fact, and these are very smart people sometimes, um, that they completely lose sight of the fact of that, hey, this is, might be a bubble. Um, all they see is they they they, they kind of go into gambling mode, you know. It, it's kind of like oh, 
wait, I can't lose. Let me put my money in there. Uh, this, you know, stock is going up or this, you know, Bitcoin or, you know, the real estate bubble of 2008, um, you know, uh, 2006, 2007, 2008, you know, the real estate properties, the houses can't go down. Let me buy a house, <laughs> you know, so, so people, for some reason, we as humans don't grow smarter in that way. We, we, we get smarter in every other, a lot of other ways, but emotionally, uh, and, you know, a lot of us have a weakness where that gambling effect comes in and we're just kind of like, we start gambling. Instead of being investors, we become gamblers. Um, and that's, that's what he's mentioning here. But I want to go back to the, let's see. What was that page? Okay. Uh... Okay, this book right here on this page on the page 176, the quote that I read earlier, and that said uh, that I said that that wasn't the one I wanted. Um, he he really makes a good point here, John Kenneth Galbraith. He says the speculative outbreak has a greater or less immunizing effect. The ensuing collapse automatically destroys the very mood of the speculation requires. It follows that an outbreak of speculation provides a reasonable assurance that another outbreak will not immediately occur. With time and the dimming of memory, dimming of memory, the immunity wears off. A recurrence becomes possible and nothing would have induced Americans to launch a speculative adventure in the stock market in 1935. By 1955, the chances are very much better. So basically, guys, what he's saying here is that, again... Memory fades, we forget our history. That's why, um, if you notice, my channel, guys, is very much focused on financial history because I think that it is one of the most important things to understand if you're going to be a stock investor. And I focus a lot on financial history, guys, on this channel because I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I have yet to see another uh, YouTube video where they discuss financial history. I mean, yeah, obviously, if you, you know, go to, like, the History Channel YouTube or, you know, if you Google or if you, you know, do like John D. Rockefeller or something and you can maybe watch a small documentary on him. But to study uh, the Great Crash, to study financial history, to study uh, failures uh, in history of companies, to study what, you know, what happened in the 1970s, what happened in the 20s, what happened in the Great Depression, uh, you know, what happened in the, you know, uh, the dot-com bubble what happened in 2008 2007 um, that is financial history guys and that is very very important because we cannot forget you know that all these things that have happened you know in 1929 this was 1929 guys and you know that was the great crash well we had another one in 2008 uh, look what happened in in in, in 2000 with the dot-com you know, you, you go before that and, you know, look what happened in the 1970s, you know, with the Nifty 50, you know, and I've discussed the Nifty 50 in previous uh, videos. Um, so, guys, it's important that we understand this financial history and that we don't rem and that we remember so that we don't repeat the same mistakes as, you know, others did in, in those great crashes and, and understand, you know, that what constitutes a bubble, what, you know, people why do people get so optimistic and and then warren buffett also talks about this you know in his interviews if you guys check out his interviews on youtube you know he talks about you know how when people are optimistic it's dangerous when people are euphoric it's dangerous for investments you do not want to be i actually have a let's see i think i wrote it down uh, maybe I didn't. Let's see. Okay. Such a feeling of trust is essential for a boom. When people are cautious, questioning, suspicious, they are immune to speculative enthusiasms. Okay. So, lesson, guys. Okay. <clears throat> if you take nothing else from this video... Please take this, okay? When you're stock investing, or I, and I think this applies to anything. It can be commodities. It can be Bitcoin. It can be real estate. It can be anything, guys. Any asset class, okay? Um, <clears throat> such a feeling of trust is essential for a boom. When people are cautious, questioning, suspicious, 
they are immune to speculative enthusiasms. And this is what Warren Buffett says. I think one of his quotes uh, from, I think his books, uh, one of his books, uh, I saw it somewhere where he said, in investing, uh, you, you know, optimism and euphoria are your enemy and pessimism is your friend. So Warren, this is Warren Buffett. And that's what it says, guys. That's what John Kenneth Galbraith says also in the book. You guys have to be questioning management you guys have to be questioning the board of directors you guys have to be questioning those balance sheets and reading the fine print you guys have to be questioning you know when management says they're going to do something and they don't do it you have to stay on top of those annual reports read your annual reports listen to the conference calls listen to what management is saying and what they are doing more importantly what what are they doing are they following through on their promises so always question the numbers okay guys so this is uh, i guess my conclusion of the book review uh, again, no major one reason what that John Kenneth points, John Kenneth Galbraith points out as to why the Great Depression happened. It did last for 10 years. Of course, we all know that one of the reasons how we came out of that Great Depression was because of World War II uh, beginning. Uh, that's why I think the country was, was lifted from that uh, Great Depression that lasted 10 years in the 1930s. Um, the Great Crash, it can, again, just to re recap, was because the, the Great Crash was because of borrowing, uh, shady behavior by the bankers, uh, blind, blinding uh, faith in the market and optimism, and, you know, these investment trusts, uh, heavy borrowing. Uh, the banks were borrowing heavily from the Federal Reserve, uh, politicians, uh, the presidents, secretary of the treasury, bankers, not knowing what the heck they're talking about, <laughs> made, made it worse. Um, uh, Paul Warburg was one of the voices of reason. But again, and from the book, you know, the prophets of doom were criticized. Uh, they said that guy knows nothing. He does not know what he's talking about. Um, prior to that, you had the Florida land boom in the 1920s. Uh, you know, it ended in 1926 because they had a couple of hurricanes in Florida and there was no more buyers. And again, for a boom to end, a speculative bubble to end, and one of the fastest ways it ends, guys, if there is no new infusion of money, okay? And people got nervous in October of 1929, they started selling off and everything crashed and a lot of people were left with nothing, okay? And again, suicides happened, people were jumping out of hotels. In New York City, a lot of bankers were committing suicide, uh, and a lot of, by the way, there was a guy, Richard Whitney, who was also uh, brought up on charges by um, Thomas Thomas Dewey. Uh, he was uh, the New York, he was a New York lawmaker. I think he was district attorney, uh, or he 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 uh, charged uh, Richard Whitney with fraud and with embezzlement from one of his companies, one of the investment trusts, uh, and. So that that were those were the reasons for the crash, guys. Um, and this is my book review, John Kenneth Galbraith, The Great Crash. If you guys have any questions, uh, please leave them down below in the in the comment section. Or comments are appreciated. I'm the stock investor guy, and so yeah, very important to study financial history, guys. Uh, have a great day, and uh, thank you for watching. Bye.